Turn in your Bibles to, well, actually be up on the screen. You don't even have to turn there. Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Verse 6, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. You know, we're in the Christmas season. We are in it now. Thanksgiving's over. We're into December. Christmas lights are up. The Christmas tree is up. You're doing your shopping. Uh, and many of you have been online more than you normally are as you buy your presents online. You've been to the stores. Perhaps you tackled Black Friday or tackled somebody on Black Friday. But you have done some of your shopping. Christmas is well into the season. I love Christmas time. I got a postcard in the mail this last week from Jews for Jesus. And on that postcard, it says, this season means, had those three words, this season means. And underneath those three words, it had an underlined blank line. And underneath that blank line, it says, your answer here. This season means your answer here. For the next few weeks, I want to talk about what is Christmas mean to you? What does Christmas mean to the church? What does Christmas mean to the world? What does the Christmas season, what does it mean to you? This season means what? Food? Rich or poor? Food? This season means presents. This season means giving thanks. This season means more time with family. This season means stress. This season means a time of reflection. This season means maxing out the credit cards. This season means hope. For you, each one of you all across this room, this season means your answer here. What does this season mean for you? And what should it mean for you, and what should it mean for the church, and what should it mean for the world? For a lot of people, maybe even you visiting here, those of you who have come today and chosen to visit with us today, for a lot of people, this season means making an effort to go to church. It really does. And the reason why is because Christmas is a great time where Jesus, the story of Jesus is told. The birth of Jesus is told. It's, you can drive down the street, and I love it, the nativity scenes in the yards. Tell the story of Jesus' birth. And Christmas is a time through even the secular music stations that play the Christmas music. Tell the story of Jesus. They tell the story of Jesus. And what it does is it creates in the hearts of people all across the world This thoughts about God. Who is God? Who is this Jesus? Is the story real? I wonder about Jesus. And because of that, they begin to think about God. They begin to think about their own lives. And if God is real, and if Jesus is real, and if the stories are all real, then is it possible that I should have a relationship with this God? And if I should have a relationship with God, then maybe I should go search for him, not at a manger, not in a barn, but at church. And so people all across the world discover that this season for them means making time to come to church. 
And there are a few times a year when people who don't normally go to church will make an effort to do so. Easter, Christmas, Mother's Day maybe, church. So if that's the case, this week I'd like to present to you and to many of us this idea of if it's a season to go to church, then why go? Why gather? You know, the wise men, this story of Jesus here, I'm not necessarily going to use this as my script this morning to preach from, but the wise men set a good example of going to church Christmas season. On coming to the house, whose house did they come to? They came to the Lord's house, right? They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down. They surrendered to Jesus. They worshiped him, the Bible says. They worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. The wise men had church. They worshiped. They came to the Lord's house, and they took up an offering. They had church. Good example. We should come to church. But seriously, though, if this is a season that means going to church for so many people, then we Christians should be able to answer this question. Why should you go to church? And why gather together more specifically? Why gather together? Obviously, people should come to church to hear about Jesus. Obviously, people should come to church to hear about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They should come to church to have the opportunity to hear that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that he rose again, that he's king of the world, that he, he, he desires to have a personal relationship with them, and they should have the opportunity to ask Jesus to be Lord of their lives so they can discover what we've all discovered, this incredible relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords. So they should come to church for that reason. But why keep coming? Why keep coming to church? Well, specifically, why gather together every single week? Why do it? Some people would say, well, we do it because of the message. We come to hear a message from the Lord. We come so that the preacher can give us a message from the Word of God, and we will hear that Word, and it will penetrate to our hearts, and it will encourage us sometimes, and it will challenge us other times, and it, will, uh, uh, it should always point us back to Jesus and tell us something about Jesus and cause a response from us to, to, to respond to Jesus. But if that's why we come to church, can't we do it better ways? Can't we present the message to people easier and in a better, more economic way? I mean, we have video cameras now. We all have uh, access to the web. We all have access to those things. So shouldn't we just videotape me in a small room giving the message and present that out to all your homes so that in your homes you can hear the gospel message and, and, and you could do it in your pajamas? Sounds pretty good for all those people watching online. A little conviction there, I guess. We could do it all in our pajamas, and we could sell this big room that requires money to heat and to keep up. And it would be less, I mean, it would be better economically for us if it was just about hearing the message and coming together. So some people would say it's about the worship. It's about coming together corporately and worshiping Jesus. It's about that. And, and, and if you said you come for the word, you're right. You come for the word. You come for the message, but there would be better ways to do it if it was just about the message. The worship, what about the worship? I'm telling you, there is something about coming together and worshiping with other believers. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And so when we come together and we begin to worship God, the presence of God shows up in a powerful way. And it's awesome. And I'm telling you, you don't want to miss worship because worship is a powerful time in the presence of God, as you saw. So people would say we come to worship God and we do it corporately. But isn't it true that the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there he is in their midst as well. So can I just gather with Pastor Tyler and Kayla in their living room and play the guitar and worship? Can I just pop in a CD in my car and worship? Yeah, you can. And the presence of God will show up and the presence of God will move in a powerful way. And so I gather every single Sunday and worship together. I mean, why do it? 
There's more economical ways to do it. There's better ways. In fact, we could just instead, if it's all about being together, let's just once a month call all the churches together and meet in the stadium and do all different styles of worship. Wouldn't that be even more powerful? It is. It's a powerful thing when you get the body of Christ, regardless of denominations, together and you pile them into a stadium and all worship together. If it's about the worship, we could do it in better ways than having churches all over the place and all gathering together. So some people would say it's about the kids. Man, it's about the kids' ministry. I love kids' ministry. It's high on our priority list here at Trinity Assembly of God. And so we, we, it's about the kids. You know what, Pastor, if I'm honest, I really don't need church every single Sunday, but I come for my kids. I come for my kids. My kids need church. They need to hear the Word of God. They need to be in Sunday school. They need to grow in JBQ. They need church. And so I come for, for my kids. They need to know who Jesus is. And so we come for that. But if that's the case, we could do it differently too. We could put that as a priority and you could just drop your kids off. And we could have incredible rooms where we just pile all of our money into the kids' ministry. We could do it better if it was just about the kids' ministry. So that brings me to the last answer that I could come up with that I thought maybe you would have, and that's because it makes God happy. I come to church because it makes God happy. I come to church because he, he likes it, so I come to church. And maybe for you that's not even true. You don't even come to make God happy. You come to make the person sitting next to you happy. And that's okay. That's a good reason to come to church. Still a great reason to come to church. You come, you make that person next to you as happy as they could be. You come just to make them happy. Great reason to come to church. That's a phenomenal reason to come to church. Worship the word, uh, uh, the kids ministry, to make God happy. But if it's just to make God happy, can't we make God happy other ways? Really, can't we? Can't we make God happy other ways? So why do we come every Sunday and gather together. Can I reboot the system for a minute? Can I unplug the plug, count to 10, and plug it back in for a second and help you understand why we do church and why we gather together, especially if you're visiting with us today? I want to reboot this thing. And here it is. The reason why I want to do this is because sometimes we get in a routine. Perhaps you came today and you, by the time you got dressed, by the time you loaded up your kids, or no kids, by the time you warmed up your car, by the time you drove here, by the time you scooted into your row and sat down, you asked yourself, why do I do this every single week? Why am I here? What am I doing here? And so I want to help you. I want to help answer that question as the church should be able to answer that question and bring it all back to the foundations of why. And to do that, we have to go back to the first time Jesus used that word church. Well, actually, he used the word ecclesia. And he used it in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. You don't have to turn there. I'll paraphrase it for you. But Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is with his disciples. Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. And he says to his disciples, hey, guys, what does the world say? Who does the world say I am? When you're in the streets, when you're in the marketplace, when you're hanging out with your family, who do they say I am? Who do they think I am? And the disciples respond, and they say to him, Jesus, some of them think that you are John the Baptist. He says, okay. And some of them said, Jesus, some of them think you're a prophet. You're Elijah, you're Jeremiah. And Jesus says, okay. And Jesus says, well, guys, if that's what they think, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? And Peter responds and he says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus, Peter recognizes who he is, just as the wise men did on, uh, when they came to visit Jesus in the Christmas story. And so he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus points at Peter and he says, you're right. You, Peter, you are right. And you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. For the first time, Jesus mentions church. He mentions the ecclesia. 
He mentions that it's going to be a, a gathering, a communing, a coming together. And in this context, he says this. It's not going to be a building. He does, he's not talking about in this church or upon this building, I'm going to build my church. He's not saying it's going to be a service. He didn't say it's going to be a place, a location. He didn't say it's going to be these religious rituals that are going to take place. But rather, he says, upon this person, I will build my church. The church isn't about a building. It's not a time from 10 to 1230, if we're lucky, tonight, today, this morning, whatever it is. It's not that. The church is relational. The church is relational. Jesus was looking for people. He wasn't looking for places. There is something about the gathering of believers together that is extremely powerful. Jesus said it this way. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against what? The church. Against us. Against the ecclesia. Against the believers who gather. Who commune together. Together the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. You see, we gather together because we're stronger together. And together we push back the gates of hell in our lives. Together as we gather, Jesus builds us. But we live in a time, we live in a time and a day and an age where everybody wants to do things by themselves. We live in a day and age where people say, I can do this alone. I can fight my battles alone. Can I tell you something? When you fight your battles alone, the gates of hell prevail against you. They prevail against you. You find yourself backed in the corner where you're being attacked and the gates of hell begin to win. But our commander in chief, Jesus Christ, he never said that you're supposed to do it alone. He never said you're in this alone, suck it up, pick your chin up and do this alone. You're all by yourself in this. No, our commander in chief said that we do this together. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells this parable that describes a church. It describes a temple. And he says, when you come to the temple, when you come to the church to give your sacrifice to God, when you come to church and you're going to bring an offering to the Lord or you're going to bring an offering of worship or praise or prayer or an offering, Jesus said this. He said, if you have offended your brother, if there is an issue with somebody else, said, leave your offering at the altar and go and make it right with them. Leave your offering at the altar. See, there's too many people that think, well, you know what? I, my life is a mess. My relationships are a mess. I've offended people. I've been angry at people. I have all these things. I'm going to go to church and make it right. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that how we think? And in our, in our, in our culture today, we would say, we would applaud those people. And I would applaud those people if they showed up today because today you're going to hear the truth of the message. And the truth of the message is God says go make it right with them so that when you bring your offering of praise to me, it's worthy. And I'll receive it. See, Jesus says it's something about the church is going to be different. I'm going to rock what used to be because the church is going to be a gathering together that's going to be relational. Jesus said it's so important that our relationships are mended. It's so important how we treat one another. It's so important that it even affects our offering and our sacrifice that we bring to the Lord on Sundays. Let's go even further. John 13. You can turn there in your Bibles. John chapter 13. Jesus is washing the disciples' feet in the beginning of John chapter 13. He has gathered the disciples into this room. They're all hanging out together. They've had a meal together, and Jesus is going to wash their feet. He's going to wash their feet. Actually, he's going to do it before the meal. And, and, and they're in there, and, and it's kind of weird for the disciples. They don't want Jesus to wash their feet. Have you ever had somebody wash your feet? A little awkward. Yes. All the children, yes. It's awesome. Love it. Thank you. It's, uh, it, so they come and they, they, 
Jesus is going to wash their feet. And Peter says to Jesus, don't wash my feet, Jesus. Don't do it. Not my feet. I don't deserve to have my feet washed. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to do this because it's an example. I am the example of what you're to do for other people. And he says, the servants among you will be the greatest among you. And he said, we're to wash other people's feet. And he leads into John chapter 13 with that. And then he begins to talk about um, the future because he knows that his time on earth is coming to an end. And it leads us to John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. And Jesus says this to the, to the d- disciples. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You see, what sets us apart as God's church, as God's ecclesia, what sets us apart as disciples of Jesus Christ, what sets us apart is not the steeples above our church buildings. It's not the property, it's not the building, it's not the time in which we have service, it's not whether we have a Sunday night service or a Sunday morning service or a Wednesday night or a Tuesday Bible study. It doesn't matter uh, what denomination is written on the side out front of our building. None of that mattered to Jesus. He didn't bring any of that up. Notice, he didn't say, this is the requirement. You know, in, in, in Bible school, uh, the pastors, we got to take these exams for our credentials to be decided if we can pass to be good pastors. And so we take these exams, and we study for the exams, and then we go in a room, and we have somebody who's called a proctor, and they sit there, and they watch to make sure we don't cheat. And you take your exam, your written exam, and it's Depending on what credentials you're going for, it depends on how many questions are on the exam. Jesus never said, I'm going to give you a written exam. Not going to get to heaven, and he's going to say, you know what, I see your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but you know what, you need to take this exam to see if you're really a disciple. Go ahead, this angel, Michael, he's going to be your proctor. Go ahead and sit in the side room. When you're done, let me know, and we'll see if the gates of hell, uh, you know, will prevail or if you prevail. So, Jesus doesn't say that. He said the one way that you're going to be different from every other religion, the one way that you're going to be different from every other disciple on planet earth, the one way that you're going to be known as a Christian, the one way that you are truly known as my disciple is not how long you spend at the altar, it's not how many times you come to the cross, it's not how many times you ask for forgiveness, but truly if you have asked for forgiveness and repentance, made me Lord of your life, the one way that everybody else will know is how you love one another. And who did he say this to? He said it to Peter and the disciples, the ones who he said to Peter, he said, upon this rock I will build my church. And then he's telling them, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave My hour is coming where I'm going to be sacrificed upon the cross and I'm going to make a new covenant and there's going to be a new thing and here's a new rule and here's the new thing that you must follow if you're really my disciples. Love one another. See, the greatest way that we are known as followers of Jesus Christ is how we one another each other. How we one another each other. You say, what am I talking about? Jesus said in John 13, love one another. But we're told in Romans 15, 7, accept one another. We're told in Galatians 6, 2, care for one another. We're told in Ephesians 4, 32, forgive one another. We're told in Hebrews 3, 13, encourage one another. Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another. Colossians 3, 13, bear one another. Bear with one another. You know what that means? That means get along. It means when you don't like the other people that you're gathering with on Sunday, just bear with them. Just suck it up. That's what that means. I'm just telling you the truth. You're going to come to church and there's going to be people that you don't like. There's going to be people different than you. There's going to be people that you just are like, come on. Really? You're in church too? (laughs) Bear with one another. Suck it up and bear with one another. He says in Galatians 6, 2, carry one another's burdens. That's what we did this morning at the altars, one another. To do all of this, we have to gather well. And I'll just say it, we can't just come and sit in the pew and think that we are one anothering each other. 
You know, I steal a quote from somebody. This was such a good quote, I had to steal it. You can't want another your bro sitting in a row. We have to want another well. And that's what the church is. And that's why we gather. We hear a message that challenges us. Yes, together we hear the message. We worship the Lord together. And yes, the Lord shows up, moves in our midst together. That happens. But there's so many other things that we have to do that don't happen in a pew and don't happen in a sanctuary room. It's gathering together in small groups. It's gathering together at events. It's gathering together over dinner and over lunch. It's gathering together in somebody's home for a prayer meeting. It's gathering together as you can call somebody and say, hey, I know this is happening in your life. I just wanted to encourage you today. Hang in there. Stay strong. That's one another in each other well. You see, the reason why we come to church is because it does make us better Christians, better believers, and it pushes us more towards Christ. But God put this together so we can one another each other. Because my relationship with God is that. It's a personal relationship with God. But together, my personal relationship with God gets better. And so together, we do it together. I want to take you to our last chapter Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll close with this and wrap it all up with this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. The author says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. All the more. In a time and a day and an age when people want to separate and do things individually and say, I can handle life on my own. I have my own group of people. This author here, I believe it's Paul, but uh, the author of Hebrews says, All the more as the day approaches, as the day of the Lord approaches, as the end draws to a near, all the more gather together. All the more come together. But I want to close with these three things that he encourages us with. He says this, he says, consider, let us consider. That word there is to be intentional. You and I, if we want to work on gathering together, we have to be intentional about one another. Be intentional. We have to, in our minds, in our thoughts, and in our actions, be intentional towards other people. When's the last time I I cared about one another? When's the last time I cared about another? When's the last time I got up from this pew to go see how that person's doing? When's the last time I made an effort to say, hey, uh, I'm so-and-so, and I'm simply looking for a friend? You know, kids want to know each other so much better than we do. And the bad habits that they have about one another are the models that we give them. But if you stick a bunch of kids in a room who are innocent and haven't had bad models, they simply know how to one another well. Sure, sin will rise up eventually, but they will one another each other well with simply, I want to be your friend. My little girl knows how to do this. You can put her any group of kids, and she will come home telling us that she has friends. You ask them what their names are, not so much. She hasn't figured that out, but she makes friends everywhere she goes. I made a friend today. I made a friend today. How would you make a friend today? Well, I walked up and said, you want to be my friend. (laughs) That's the last time he did that. Just looking for a friend. Just looking for somebody to sit with at church today. Can I sit with you? Maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe we just bear with one another. (laughs) But can we do it together? Can we do it together today? we got to consider one another. When's the last time you considered somebody in the situation they're in? And said, man, I can do something about that. I'm not just putting their life to sit across the church from them. I'm putting their life because I'm here to do something for them. And so together we do something and we consider somebody else's problems and somebody else's situations and we step in and we help. Second thing he says is we spur. He says how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. That's not really a good word. 
If you thought that was going to be like exciting or like, mm, yeah, I want somebody to spur me on. I don't know. We're not really from Texas, so we don't really understand what a spur is, but you don't want to be spurred. Spurs are not fun. But he says, how can we spur one another on? That word to spur is not so much hearing what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And the question is, if we're not gathering together well, if we're not one anothering each other well, then we have no right spurring each other. I don't have any right to step into your world and, and tell you what you need to hear if I haven't gathered together with you well. But I need people in my life that will spur me. And you need people in your life that will spur you. And when you're close to people, and when you, I was just talking to somebody yesterday, they were talking about life groups, and they didn't realize how important life groups were, and because when you get in a good life group that, that you connect with, and a group of people, and that can be an organized life group like we have here at church, it could be a group of men that meet in a garage, and you work on cars, and you talk about your life, and what's happening in your life, and what Jesus is doing, and or you just talk about situations in your family, and you pray for one another, whether it's there, or you pray just in your own quiet times for one, each, one another, that, that is a small group. And when you gather together well with people, you can spur one another towards what? Love and good works. You see, a lot of people would honestly say the church isn't so good at gathering together, but the world is. The world knows how to gather together well. Because they'll gather around you regardless of the situation, say, hey, let's go to the bar Let's hang off. Let's drink this off. I'll go with you. Come on, let's go. We'll do this together. We'll go through this together. But the church says, oh, man, that's going on in their lives. Man, they need Jesus. And they don't do it together. Instead of saying, wow, look what's going on in their life. They need Jesus. I'm the church. I'm the body of Christ. We're in this together. Can we go through this together for a moment? Can I talk to you? Can we pray together? I know this is going on with your kids. Can we do this together? What, what do you need? What do you need help with? You know, I, I, I wish the church was filled with even more single moms. Because single moms feel like they're doing it all alone. Well, they should come to the church and discover that they shouldn't have to do it alone. We'll do this with you. We'll do this together. I don't know what that means. We're not going to step on your toes. We're not going to judge. We're not going to get involved in your business. But what can we do to help you as you raise your kids? How can we do this together? We spur each other on in good works and in love, towards love and good deeds, he says. You know, if the church was good at this, then we could push each other to be better. You know, we're going to play golf with somebody, and, and we're paying for the golf, and the person just is not nice to the cashier. You can get in the golf cart and say, dude. You can just chew that person out for no good reason. They know where we go to church. They know we're Christians. <laughs> They're supposed to know we're Christians by our love. That wasn't a good move. You know, and, and if we gather together well, that person hopefully will take that well and go, yeah, you're right. You know, what, what do you think I should do now? Well, I, I'll go back in there with you and let's just apologize to them. That's a good place to start. We spur each other as we live life together. And then lastly, he says this, encourage, but let us encourage one another in all the more, all the more illustrate this by saying that we are to encourage one another. You know, I, I, I remember moments in my life as a youth pastor wondering, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I pouring into these kids? And then they go off to college and they run from God. Why do I, am I investing all these years into these kids' lives? And then all of a sudden I get a letter in the mail from a parent. And I open it up and it's encouragement. I know my son or daughter's off doing this and I know the investment that you made in their life, but I want to encourage you that this is where I saw fruit and this is how it's helped me, and this is maybe something that I saw them do the other day, and it encouraged me, and it kept me on course, and it kept me faithful to what God was asking me to do. I remember moments in my life before I was living for God where I would be in church, and somebody would wrap their arms around me and tell me what Jesus did for me, and tell me Jesus did that for you because he had hope, hope in you, believed in you. 
And they encourage me. Can we encourage one another? Can we consider, spur, and encourage one another? As we gather well, as we want another well, we become healthy. And this is the beauty of it. Healthy people attract people. Healthy people attract people. People are attracted to healthy people. What I mean by that is if you're healthy emotionally and spiritually and mentally and in your home life and in your business life and things are healthy and things are thriving, people are drawn to that. And Jesus wanted to use that. People. Healthy people. Whether we got situations just like everybody else, when you're coming together, you're a lot healthier. And Jesus wanted to use that to build his church. And Jesus says, I will build my church. It's his responsibility to build the church. But we are the church. And the better that we gather together, the better he is able to grow it. Because it's more attractive to other people. Can I ask you all to...